Hi everyone, this is Nurse Anna from NurseStudy.net and today we're going to be talking about myasthenia gravis. This website is not intended to provide medical advice. The articles on this website are intended for entertainment or educational value only. While we strive to offer 100% accuracy, medical procedures are rapidly changing and laws vary greatly from location. So myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune neuromuscular disorder that's characterized by muscle weakness and fatigue. The weakness of skeletal muscles worsens upon exertion and actually improves after rest periods. This disorder results from failure or error in transmission of impulses between the nerves and muscles. And although it is relatively a rare condition, myasthenia gravis can affect people of all ages it is most commonly seen in women younger than 40 years of age and in men above 60 years of age. At present, there is still no cure for myasthenia gravis, but treatment aims in relieving signs and symptoms and improving the patient's quality of life. Now we're going to look at the signs and symptoms. As the weakness of the affected muscles improves with rest, muscle weakness can actually come and go and is likely to progress over time along with other symptoms. It will usually worsen years after developing the disease, and the degree of the muscle weakness also will vary. Majority of the cases involves complications of the eye as an initial symptom, while others develop neck and throat problems first. Other signs and symptoms will include muscle weakness with activity. This is actually a hallmark sign. Weakness of the eye muscles, ptosis, which is drooping of one or both eyelids, diplopia, which is double vision, speech impairment, difficulty in chewing and swallowing, changes in facial expressions, limb and neck muscle weakness. Now we're going to look at some causes and risk factors. Causes muscles and nerves which communicate through neurotransmitters which are chemicals released by the nerves and matches into the receptor sites found in the neuromuscular junction. So when there's a continuous problem in this process that we just described of the transmission, myasthenia gravis can start to develop. The immune system blocks the receptor sites for a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine by producing antibodies. So less receptor sites cause insufficient acetylcholine secretion and fewer nerve signals result in muscle weakness. These antibodies also block protein function of tyrosine kinase, a protein enzyme associated in the formation of neuromuscular junction. An abnormally large thymus gland and or presence of thiomas, which are tumors in the thymus gland, also play a role in the development of myasthenia gravis by promoting the projection of acetylcholine blockers. There's actually also a type of myasthenia gravis that is antibody negative, meaning the root cause is the antibodies are working against the lipoprotein related protein 4 and not by blocking acetylcholamine. Another type is a rare heredity form called congenital myasthenia syndrome, which is present at birth. Other factors that may aggravate myasthenia gravis include other causes and risk factors would include fatigue, pre-existing illness, stress, certain medications such as beta blockers, certain anesthetics, and some antibiotics, pregnancy. In rare cases, mothers with myasthenia gravis have children who are born with the same condition known as neonatal myasthenia gravis or congenital myasthenic syndrome, menstrual periods. It's been long suspected that this may exacerbate during the menstrual period, but it's never really been adequately documented. Now we're gonna move on to complications. The complications of myasthenia gravis can be treated while others can lead to more critical conditions. People with myasthenia gravis may have the following complications. Myasthenic crisis. This is an acute exacerbation of the disease that occurs when muscle weakness progresses to the muscles that control breathing. It is life-threatening and needs emergency treatment. Also, thymus gland tumors. Most of these tumors are benign and not cancerous. Other complications would be hypothyroidism, which is an underactive thyroid, or hyperthyroidism, which is an overactive thyroid. Hypothyroidism causes cold intolerance, weight gain, and other problems, while it is the opposite for hyperthyroidism, which causes heat intolerance and weight loss. Autoimmune conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis and lupus are other complications. For diagnosis, 
We're looking at doing a neurological examination, an edrophonian test, ice pack test, blood analysis, repetitive nerve stimulation, single fiber EMG, imaging tests such as CT scan or MRI, and pulmonary function tests. Treatments are going to depend on age, severity, progression of disease. The following treatments may be used alone or in conjunction with other treatments. The first thing for treatments will be medication therapy, cholinesterase inhibitors. These drugs will aim to improve muscle strength and contractility by enhancing the communication between the nerves and the muscles. Then we have corticosteroids. These drugs are going to suppress the immune system by inhibiting production of antibodies. Corticosteroids such as prednisone should be used cautiously to prevent serious side effects. And then we also have immunosuppressants. These drugs weaken the immune system, which also increases the risk for infection. Now we're going to move on to intravenous therapy. The first one being plasmapheresis. This is a procedure that uses filtration process to remove the antibodies. Repeated procedures may be necessary for this treatment since the benefit usually lasts for only a few weeks. Associated risks will include, could include, sorry, hypotension, bleeding, cardiac problems, and allergic reaction. And we can move on to IVIG. This improves the immune system response by providing the body with normal antibodies. And then we have monoclonal antibody. This is an option for people unresponsive to other treatments. Another treatment would be surgery. In cases where a tumor is in the thymus gland, a thioma, the surgical removal would be necessary. The procedure for this would be called a thymectomy. This is where a doctor will remove the thymus gland. It is done as an open surgery or usually minimum invasive approach as a video assisted thymectomy or robot assisted thymectomy. These procedures have minimal blood loss and lower mortality rates. Even in the absence of a tumor, this procedure helps the improvement of the symptom. So now we're going to move on to a sample nursing care plan. I have several of these on the article on nursestudy.net. I think there's two or three more care plans. If you were interested, they are free. Feel free to go over there and check them out. The first one would be a nursing diagnosis, ineffective breathing pattern related to respiratory muscle weakness, secondary to myasthenia gravis as evidenced by shortness of breath, an O2 sat level of 85% and labored breathing. Desired outcome? The patient will achieve effective breathing pattern as evidenced by respiratory rates between 12 and 20 breaths per minute, oxygen saturation within the target range, and verbalize ease of breathing. For the first intervention, we would assess the patient's vital signs and characteristics of respirations at least every four hours. And the rationale for this would be to assist in creating an accurate diagnosis and monitor effectiveness of medical treatment. Intervention. Administer supplemental oxygen as prescribed. Discontinue if O2 sat level is above the target range or is ordered by the physician. Rationale, to increase the oxygen level and achieve the O2 value within the targeted range. Intervention, administer the prescribed medications. Rationale, bronchodilators to dilate or relax the muscles on the airways. Steroids to reduce the inflammation in the lungs cholinesterase inhibitors to improve muscle strength and contractility by enhancing the communication between the nerves and the muscles. Intervention. Elevate the head of the bed. Assist the patient to assume a semi fowler's position. Rationale. Head elevation and semi fowler's position help improve the expansion of the lungs, enabling the patient to breathe more effectively. Intervention. Prepare the patient for surgery if indicated. In the rationale, in cases where a tumor in the thymus gland called thioma is present, surgical removal is necessary. The procedure is called a thymectomy where the doctor removes the thymus gland. Okay guys, this concludes my Cynthia Gravis um, by Nurse Anna. Please visit us as nursestudy.net. I have a couple more care plans for this topic. Actually, all my topics have uh, two to five different care plans on in each article. So be sure to visit at nursestudy.net. Have a great day.